Republican candidate for U.S. Senate, Daryl Glenn, joining us. Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So one of the, clearly the topical question of, of the minute is the Donald Trump video that came out last week mm -hmm. that showed him talking about grabbing women by the genitals. Where do you stand now? I know you had some statements come out, but as you sit, stand here today, where are you on this? Well, I think first, I think a lot of people, you know, as a Christian, as a father of two daughters, I was very troubled um, by those statements. Uh, I do give him credit, uh, and it's a, to me, it's important to stand up and take responsibility for that. And he did that at the debate. And I think that that was very important because I don't think anybody wants to support or even endorse a person that objectifies women. That's not something that we tolerate as a society. Uh, so I'm glad that he did the right thing. You also tweeted out that you're praying on, on this. What, what does that involve on, what, and what is your decision? Well, I think it was important because we have not been able to really talk about the issues and one of the things that happened during this debate, and this has been the frustration for a lot of down-ballot candidates, Donald Trump finally had the opportunity and he executed on prosecuting the case on why Hillary Clinton is unacceptable to be elected as president. We've been wanting to have a debate over the issues and we finally got to the point to where he's done that. And I'm actually going to get on a plane uh, we're trying to arrange that right now on Thursday to go out there and personally talk to Mr. Trump uh, because he made a statement in the fact that he recognizes and he wants to be the president of the United States for everyone. I've been working with our underserved communities and there's a lot of frustration and anger and the fact that Republicans never come in and talk and address issues that are impacting those communities and I want to share them with him and I want to then extend an invitation for him to come to Colorado and have a conversation in town hall with a group that I've been working with. So that, that's when you'll make a decision, after you have this face-to-face -face meeting? It's important for me to convey the message of what I've heard to him. And I am going to personally extend that invitation to him and find out if he's willing to come here. Because I think he will. I honestly believe that he will take us up on that opportunity. It's extremely important. Because that really goes to testing whether or not he wants to represent everyone. Well, let's go with what we know as of today prior to this meeting. In your last statement I saw, you were calling for Donald Trump to do the honorable, selfless thing, voluntarily step aside and let Mike Pence be our party's nominee. This was prior to the second debate. He's not stepping aside. Are you voting for Donald Trump? What I want to do, and again, he needed to do what he did during the debate. Number one, he needed to apologize and accept personal responsibility for that. He did that. He needed to be able to show that he is going to be able to prosecute the case against Hillary Clinton. He did that. That was my main concern, because if you're not able to do that, you can't actually run for this office and win. Now that he's done that, I want to look him in the eye and extend an invitation for him to come to Colorado and have those conversations with the underserved communities. So you haven't decided? Correct. You won't say who you were voting for yet? Well, I am not supporting Hillary Clinton, and I believe that Donald Trump, based on what he's saying, I want to see if he is a man of action and he's willing to come and talk to the underserved community and have that conversation. It's extremely important. Because Hillary Clinton laid out a plan when, you, when she talked about her Supreme Court appointments. That's extremely telling on what he's going to do. Hillary Clinton then, when pressed about the emails and the servers and her involvement in Syria, lied again. These are extremely important issues that we must be able to debate because it's extremely important for people to have an opportunity to really find out what is it that the Republicans stand for if he's running to be commander-in-chief, if he's running to be the person that's going to unite the country, he needs to be willing to come to our underserved communities and be able to have a conversation with the people that I've been working with. That's going to go a long way. Let's make the smooth transition now to some of the issues. Let's start with uh, recreational marijuana, which is legal in Colorado, and there's many states that are, five states, that are going to be considering uh, legalizing recreational marijuana. Uh, I don't know your thoughts from, from being an El Paso County Commissioner, how this has benefit or hurt so far the area, 
and moving into a congressional seat as a senator, mm -hmm. what that could mean nationwide? Well, I think it's extremely important because right now we're not really addressing the issue. Uh, it's a state's rights issue, and the federal government is saying uh, and is using their authority in that area. In my opinion, the entire delegation should be working to clarify that particular issues on whether or not they're going to defer and allow states to exercise that right. Now, I am personally opposed to that, but your job as a senator is to represent the will of the state that you're representing. And this is a critical issue that we must debate and discuss. I personally believe that you know, we need to go back and look at the reclassification. Where my passion is in dealing with veterans, I've talked to a lot of veterans. I've talked to people that are, have, are in a constant state of pain. And, and they want to believe and use this particular treatment. Now, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV. But I think we need to have more thorough research. And if you go in there and look at the reclassification of that, then you can put it into your pharmacies the appropriate way. My biggest concern and the experience I have as an El Paso County Commissioner, it has created some public safety issues. We're now seeing some unfunded requirements that are, are putting a burden on our law enforcement. You're having people that will come to the community and buy houses for cash. And, and because they're wanting to participate in this, they're seeing a rise in uh, property crimes and heroin uses. So we need to continue to work this particular issue, and it's not going to go away. Let's uh, switch to highway funding. You know, that's a large part of Colorado's budget. Much of the money used to improve interstates and highways comes from federal funding and grants. So what priorities would you set for improving our roads and bridges? Well, we do need to make sure that the Highway Users Trust Fund is being used for that purpose. And then we need to free up those dollars and allow states to have more control of those dollars. Because I can tell you, states are very creative with how they fund their infrastructure. And I believe that the more control that you give over to the states with regard to the allocation of the fundings, uh, state organizations like the ones that I participate with, transportation, different commissions, they have a way of setting priorities so that you look at the economic impact of having congestion within your region and you set those priorities. But you need the funding to come down from the federal government and give you the maximum flexibility to do that. I'm committed to, to doing that. So you traveled the state and you had told us you had done so in your environmentally friendly Hummer. Um, what's your biggest transportation headache? And as a senator, how could you fix that? Well, when you, I think all of us have had our time spinning on I-25 and then I-70 and how frustrating that is. And that is an economic impact to us because that's our major corridors. Uh, and I think that we need to do what we can to free up federal dollars to be able to help us expand those highways so that we can use those to our economic advantage. Let's talk education. Where do you stand on Common Core? I'm against Common Core. What I want to do, and my opponent is, uh, is trying to say that I'm against education, and I just want, I am not for cutting education. I'm for empowering parents. I'm for empowering states. I actually stand up and will support vouchers, which my opponent will not support. I think we need to look at what's in the best interest of that child and realize that children learn differently. But we need to be able to give states and teachers more flexibility to be innovative and creative with how we're able to educate our children. One of the things that I'm very passionate about is, is the fact that I had a young, young child uh, come to me very early on in my campaign, uh, was autistic, I think he was about eight years old, and worked with his mom for about a week to be able to ask me one fundamental question. What are you going to do to ensure that I'm able to continue to go to school with my mother? That's what's so important. Children learn differently, and we need to be supporting all opportunities. I'm also passionate about what's going on in our underserved communities. And when you start thinking about that one equalizer to lift people up, uh, a child should be able to be able to use vouchers. If you're living in an underserved area, you should have the same economic opportunity to be able to participate in schools. Just because you support choice doesn't mean that you're anti-public um, schools, but you want to provide a full menu of opportunity and provide those parents with maximum choice. You've used that word underserved multiple times now. What, what does that mean? Who are you talking about? When you're looking at some concerns within the black and brown communities, communities they're real. I'm in there talking to people. When you're going in there and looking at the unemployment rate, especially in the black and brown community, it, it, is, the, it is something that's real to them. And I, you need a champion to be able to go in there and fight. 
because our labor participation rate is a D, and that's unacceptable. And when you start talking about economic prosperity, there are people out there that are struggling each and every day just to be able to get by, paying two to three jobs, working two and three jobs. And then when you factor that in on top of seeing insurance premium increases, these things are crushing families, are crushing the middle class, and that's something where I feel it's important that they need a voice. We're going to backdoor our way into health care by asking about Amendment 69 first, Colorado Care, as a Colorado voter. What should voters know about your stance and why? I'm absolutely opposed to that. Uh, when you start looking at our health insurance system, I think it is important to, I, you look at the things that when they, you talk about uh, Obamacare and, and Michael Bennett, has doubled down on his support for that. And I'm concerned with the fact that it's not enough for Republicans to just say we need to repeal it. We need to have a plan. And we do need to repeal it, but recognize that the pre-existing conditions, recognize the fact that you know parents like the opportunity, if they can help their children out that are under 26, to be able to be on their health care plan. But we have to look at common sense, too. When you're out shopping for a good or a service, you have a better chance of receiving a better quality product at a cheaper price when there's competition. The Affordable Care Act absolutely does the exact opposite. It's collapsing, collapsing the system. We're seeing um, an opportunities where health providers are leaving our market. Uh, when you start looking at the insurance premium, especially you go out on the western slope, people are looking at between a 20 to 40 percent premium increase. We need to increase competition across state lines. We need to be able to encourage savings so that you can create health savings accounts. We need to have some tort reform. We build in competition like this, and we're going to have a better opportunity to provide a quality product and be able to help more people. Is there a difference between repeal and reforming Obamacare? Yes, you have to repeal it because the constitutional mandate is, number one, in my opinion, unconstitutional. And two, it prevents free market opportunities. And it's just from a fundamental standpoint, your government should not be able to dictate to you that you have to purchase a good or a service. Competition is going to increase when you remove that mandate and you allow the market to take over. Let's talk immigration. You know that's a huge issue this presidential year. Where do you stand on U.S. immigration policies? What would you change? Um, yeah, what would you change? This is an area where, you know, both parties have dropped the ball. Uh, there are three fundamental things that should be done immediately and on a bipartisan basis. Securing our border is a national security issue. Each and every one of us know how important it is to me uh, to recognize the fact that there are people that do not appreciate our quality of life and that they are a danger to our environment. And we've got to be able to secure our border to try to identify those particular individuals that want to do us harm. The second thing is we already have laws on the books, but they're not all being enforced. You know, you need to use the legislative process. If you don't like the laws that are on the book, use the legislative process to change those laws. Do not use executive orders to do that. The third thing that you need to do is recognize that we must look at reforming our legal immigration system and make sure it's functioning as lean and as efficient as possible. Because there are things, when you start looking at the fact that somehow this administration was able to grant citizenship to over 800 people that were on our watch list, that's unconscionable. We don't have the technology in place or we're not using it appropriately to be able to identify and protect us. That's something that can't stand. So those three things should be able to be worked out and agreed upon on a bipartisan basis. And when we do those things first, then you build up credibility to have future discussions. But that's what needs to be focused on right now. It seems like the top of your ticket can't even agree on where it stands when it comes to different parts of what we talk about with immigration, when it comes to Muslim ban or, or refugees. Who do you support in terms of, of what we're hearing, at least in the second debate? Are you supporting Donald Trump or Mike Pence in their belief? Because there seemed to be disagreement at that second debate. Well, I, and, and I don't know what they've talked about or not, but what I need to try to remind people is Congress is a separate but equal branch of government. That's what the frustration is, is the fact that Congress has not done its job. Uh, you're there to follow the Constitution. You're there to hold the executive branch accountable to the Constitution. You're there to work cooperatively with that, but you are a separate but equal branch of government. That's what I'm focused on.
I brought up the second debate for the presidential race. You will be competing in one televised debate with Michael Bennett, and it's not going to be on this station. We could have a whole other show about your disagreements with the Denver Post, which was going to be a partner with us to have that debate. We had Dick Wadhams on, Republican strategist, who said that both you and Bennett, he had respect for both of you, but said you're failing Colorado voters mm -hmm. by only having one televised debate. Are you failing Colorado voters? A absolutely not. Where I'm willing to meet with and have a discussion, debate, or forum with Senator Bennett anytime. What I would prefer is actually to have a venue, put two microphones down there, and allow people to come up and personally ask us questions from the floor. The issue has been the moderator. The moderator cannot be the focus of any debate. That's why you're seeing so much frustration that's out there. People want their questions asked and answered, and the moderator should blend in. And the one the issue that I had was, that, yeah, and we had talked about that, and the moderator would have been more of a focus, and that's not appropriate. People should be able to look and listen to my policies and what Mr. Bennett's policies are and make an informed decision. So it's still not too late. Each and every day that Michael Bennett wants to come out and have a discussion in public, I'm willing to do it. Like I said, put two microphones out there, have a venue, and allow people to come up. We come here, we sit down, we can have a talk and talk about issues. I'm ready to go. That person would not have been the only moderator, by the way. And is that not putting your wishes and desires first before voters' wishes and desires? They want to hear about you. They want to know who you are. A absolutely. But when you're it's saying that a moderator has to be there, then you're elevating the moderator over the content. And if the moderator is a subject of the issues that are uh, on the table, that's not an appropriate word for a moderator. That's the whole definition of a moderator is to be impartial. And when you can demonstrate through the evidence that I put out there that the moderator is not impartial, that's the issue. I think we need to point out we're not talking about either of us here. That's right. But again, <laughs> we could have a whole other show about that. Uh, one last issue question. It, it's probably dead on arrival as we talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, this idea of a 12-nation agreement with the U.S. Is there any part of anything that you could come up with that would help Colorado? in a TPP agreement? Well, I, I think that we, what we have to do is understand the philosophy behind free trade, which is something that we want to support. Same thing with uh, being able to be energy independent. What we want to do is be able to allow the American workers and our, to be able to be on a level playing field. And we don't want to give up our sovereignty. And with TPP, when you start thinking about that was a big issue, being able to create a, a, you know, basically a board of unelected people that would be able to make rules that we would not be able to have influences, that should be a deal breaker with TPP right there. Uh, so I think it's extremely important to stand up for free trade, but also make sure that we stand up for sovereignty and make sure the American worker has a level playing field to be able to compete, because I will always side with the American worker every day. What is it that people don't know about you that you would like for them to know? Uh, that I am a public servant, that this isn't about filling a resume. Uh, I have spent the additional time, that's why I started my campaign early, to go out and talk to people. And there's so many people that are praying over this race, and there's so many people that are hurting, and they have not had the opportunity to be able to share that pain with their representative. And they need to understand that I'm willing to do that. I've listened to them, I've cried with them, and I'm going to champion their issues. It's not about going to Washington, D.C. and being a reliable boat for the administration. It's about standing up for the American people. It's about standing up for your constituents. My dad wants to know what an environmental-friendly Hummer is, but you're saved by the bell. You get two minutes for whatever you'd like to say without us asking a question, and you can direct it straight at that camera right there. Well, first of all, I want people to know uh, what a privilege it is to serve. Uh, I, you know, I grew up in a, in a military family, went to the Air Force Academy, spent 21 years serving this country, retired as a lieutenant colonel. So service is on my heart. Uh, I am very, uh, uh, faith is extremely important to me. And I know a lot of you are scared. I know a lot of you are angry in your frustration. And I know two things, trust has been broken. And my campaign and commitment is to restore that trust, to be able to let you know that you have somebody that's going to fight for you, that's not going to be able to just sell out to special interest groups or party leadership, that's just going to make sure that they represent you, because you deserve that. And I want you all to understand and believe in the fact that your vote matters. Believe in the fact that you can make a difference. A generational change is coming. 
Be proud of who and what you are. I'm proud of America. Our future is bright. God bless each and every one of you. Let's go win this.